I think the mandated vaccines are a terrible idea. I think they're going to cause far more trouble than, than any good they can do. You've studied the regimes of communism, uh, Nazism of the 20th century, how sophisticated societies can fall into the most authoritarian, terrible genocidal places. And I think a part of that is governments using fear to persuade people to comply. And I don't want to compare the lockdowns directly. And disgust. And disgust. And disgust. And, and, but there, there's just there, fear of contamination. There, there surely some is some sense. kind of compa comparison, right? Well, you know, the comparisons are there. I mean, a lot of what the Nazis did were, were public health. They were, guys, they were in the guise of public health. I mean, the eradication of the unfit. That was public health. That, that was justification. I happen to also believe firmly that global and even national attempts to deal with climate change are going to cause way more trouble than accumulated carbon dioxide. Not because accumulated carbon dioxide isn't somewhat of a threat, but when it becomes a global planetary threat that's a crisis, then, well, then it's a justification for virtually any political action. If the profane becomes inflated with the sacred, then you demonize your enemies. You know, and then maybe you, sac you sacralize yourself as well, and that's not so good. You know, you're an environmentalist. It's like, well, are you sure you're not the Messiah? Are you sure that's not what you're doing? You're the savior of the planet. It's like, are you sure that's so good for your ego? And it's not. It's, it's not. It's not. You know, the earth has to orbit the sun in Jung's terminology, or it if it falls into the sun, it's a catastrophe. And all sorts of discussions we're having are becoming inflated with, with religious concerns. And then, you know, on the materialist atheist side, this, let's say the scientific side, although it's not really that, there's this insistence that religion is nothing but a set of mistaken scientific propositions about the nature of reality, which it's certain that's, that's not a very sophisticated analysis. And I, I've seen this sort of thing start to happen to people like Richard Dawkins. I mean, he's, he's fallen prey. He's become victim to the collapse of the religious into the political. It's not good. And, and this has nothing to do with arguments about, you know, do I believe in God or does God exist? It's like, that's not the point of this. That's not the point. That's not, that's not the issue here. The issue is we have a religious instinct. And, and then the question is why? And, and then the question is, well, what happens when it's not nourished? Where does it go? What does it do? Well, the rationalist idea is, well, if we get rid of all that superstitious claptrap, we'll just be like straight rationalist materialists and the world will move in a positive direction. It's like, it, no, no, wrong, too simple. That isn't, where do we get our values? And that's the conversation I'm trying to have with people. That, that's a big part of it is, look, the do science does not provide values. We need values or, or nihilism or reigns. And, and you want that? No. So where do we get our values? And if there are values, are some values higher than others? And if so, what are the highest values? And what are they opposed to? And how do we embody them? These aren't conversations for children. Jordan Peterson. One of the most important intellectuals of our age, is absolutely right. What he is saying here, is that when we get rid of our religious traditions, what to a large extent has happened in our post-Christian Western societies, we do not end up in a more rational, tolerant, freer or more humane society, but in the exact opposite. When we turn our backs to our society's Judeo-Christian and Biblical roots, we do not get rid of religion, we just replace it with a new one. As we all have religious instincts, we need a reason to believe in something. Every religion needs its dogmas, its truth, its heretics, its morality, its values, and its own story of salvation and judgment, sinners and saints, good and evil. We all have also a religious instinct to wonder, admire, and worship something greater than ourselves, and the need for belonging to something that shares our values and beliefs. If we cannot fulfill these needs within the boundaries of traditional religions, we find them elsewhere. If we reject the authority of the Pope or the Bible, we just find that authority from elsewhere. From the science, or those who claim to be the high priests and priestess of the religion of scientism. For example, 
whoever dares to question the scientific dogma about man-made climate change, is branded as a heretic and climate denialist. No matter how much they have scientific data to support their hypothesis. How dare you! Or whoever who may agree that anthropogenic climate change is real, but dares to disagree with the solutions that governments are offering for this supposed threat, is branded also as the science denier and the enemy of our children's future. Now I have to say, this um, process has not exactly been helped by the corrosive effect on public opinion of those climate change skeptics. Their suggestion that hundreds of scientists around the world and those who accept their dispassionate evidence, including presumably, ladies and gentlemen, myself, are somehow secretly conspiring to undermine and deliberately destroy the entire market-based capitalist system which now dominates the world. So I would ask how these people are going to face their grandchildren and admit to them that they actually failed their future. So I wonder, will such people be held accountable at the end of the day for the absolute refusal to countenance a precautionary approach? When we reject the salvation of the cross of Calvary, we just replace it with the salvation of Mother Earth. When we do not believe in the Last Judgment, we find our new story of Armageddon and Judgment Day. The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is how are we going to pay for it? People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! And when we discard our Judeo-Christian roots and all values and morals that have sprouted from our religious tradition, we need to invent our own secular version of Ten Commandments. Would we accept ones that are expressed in Georgia Guidestones? Those Guidestone states that they were erected to an age of reason, and written in eight modern languages and four ancient languages, they include Ten Commandments for the New Age. Its first commandment states, maintain humanity under 500 million, in perpetual balance with nature. Its Tenth Commandment adds, be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. This underlines the Malthusian core principle of the radical environmental movement. That there are too many of us, and that humans are the cancer of the planet. I do want to go into the psychology of woke in a moment, and obviously you've touched on it there, but just let's focus in on motive. You talk about the outcome of this could be deaths, it could be disastrous. Um, you talk about Mao, uh, Stalin, um, and this is what we may be heading to. Is their motive, is um, woke people's motive uh, for there to be deaths? Do you think that they are, you know, uh, is there some kind of cynical, evil underlying um, motive? Or do you think that this will just happen as a byproduct of their ideas and a byproduct of how their movement and, uh, and how critical race theory works? Uh, it will primarily be a by byproduct. I should say that there are actually people who um, have, I don't think that there's anybody, or there are some, there are very few, it's very fringe for anybody to be calling openly for deaths. Uh, outside of one very kind of niche and weird environmental movement, which would kind of be summarized under, you see it with your, your Extinction Rebellion, that we are the virus mentality. There are actually a lot of environmentalists who have a kind of a critical approach to, a critical theory approach to environmentalism, uh, who definitely believe that part of the problem is that there are far too many humans and that really the only way to fix that problem is going to be to get rid of a lot of them. What about, what about the people who protest? What about kind of Extinction Rebellion? Can you empathize with why you might go out onto the streets and say, take this issue seriously? No, but do you understand why they go yes, out onto the streets? Yes, of course I do. Street? Yes, because I knew in the end people would get fed up and all these young feel nothing is ever happening. So of course they're going to get frustrated. 
I totally understand. Uh, they have stopped ambulances from getting to hospital. Uh, their leader, uh, Mr. Hallam, said that even if it was an emergency, if an ambulance had to get to a hospital as an emergency, they would still block its path. And because of that, I've been looking at the law and I think this actually qualifies as an act of terrorism. Taking action that can lead to somebody else losing their life is an act of terrorism. They're now threatening to, uh, in some way, disrupt COP26, which of course is going on in just a few weeks' time. Um, and they are proper, full-on, nutjob alarmists. And the most depressing thing is they found a new champion somebody who sympathizes with their point of view. And I'm, I regret to say it is the heir to the throne, Prince Charles, who understands their frustrations. Well, I've got to tell you, uh, the vast majority of the public don't. We're absolutely furious with them. They're stopping people getting to work. They're stopping people going to funerals. They're stopping people going to hospital, catching flights and all the rest of it. And they really, you know, we need to clamp down on these people um, and put them in prison. It's just as simple as that. Here is a part of what Nigel was mentioning about uh, ambulances being stopped by these lunatics. Have a look. She's in the ambulance! She's going to the hospital in Canterbury! They got stupid! She's in Canterbury! I need to go to the hospital! Please, no Please! How can you be so We cannot make the equation balance unless we seriously address how we stabilize and even reduce the human population of the world. And this, of course, raises some very difficult moral questions. We each carry the same responsibility, and it surely has to be asked whether it is not time we came to a view that balances the traditional attitude to the sacred nature of life on the one hand with, on the other, those teachings within each of the sacred traditions that urge humankind to keep within the limits of nature's benevolence and bounty. This is a question that could never have been imagined in the days when the sacred texts of each of the religions were first written down. But the world situation is now so very different that we may be entitled to inquire whether the leaders of those faiths, as well as the world's political leaders, might consider the plight of the earth the sustainer upon whom we all depend, and the sacredness of all her life. We are all of us sons of the earth, and perhaps the time has come to ponder what is the responsible thing to do in the present circumstances. With the most charming voice and the most posh accent, herein Prince Charles is calling openly for the genocide with never seen proportions. When he asks us to rethink our traditional attitudes of sacred nature of the life, he means that traditional view of the sanctity of a human life, in Judeo-Christian religion, should be sacrificed on the altar of more collectivist ethics, which believes that is more important to maintain, and protect the planet as a whole than its individual members of one particular species. As a basis for this, of course, is the anti-human core doctrine of the radical environmental movement, that we are cancer on the planet, whose existence and prosperity threaten the planet's survival. In 1966 historian Lynn White, asserted that the burden of guilt for our ecological crisis rested mainly on the shoulders of the Judeo-Christian faith. Despite scholarly criticism for his thesis, according to Lynn, the emergence of exploitative modern technologies and roots behind population explosion, are at least partly to be explained as a realization of the Christian dogma, of man's transcendence of, and rightful mastery over nature. Since that, this has become one of the core beliefs of the modern environmental movement, and that's why Greens have not been very sympathetic to the Christian faith. For a long time, Greens have also flirted with a pantheistic belief, whereby there is no distinction between God and nature. British environmentalist Jonathan Porritt, who has been an advisor to Prince Charles in Green Issues, wrote in his foreword to Ian Bradley's book, God is Green, in any objective analysis of the root causes of today's ecological crisis, there are many who still incline the opinion that the Christian church has always been, and still is, part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Prince Charles agrees.
In his own foreword to Jonathan Port's book Save the Earth, he wrote, In Western terms, one of the underlying factors which may have contributed, by being taken literally, to the desire to dominate nature, rather than live in harmony with it on a sustainable basis, is to be found in the book of Genesis where it records, that God said unto man, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. To me, that Old Testament story has provided Western man, accompanied by his Judeo-Christian heritage, with an overbearing and domineering attitude towards God's creation, a feeling that the world is somehow entirely man's to dispose of, as income rather than capital asset which needs husbanding. By contrast, the Quran specifically mentions the fact that the natural world is loaned by God. End quote. Whether you believe in God or not, the biblical creation story, has been most consequential to our Western history, and our Western values. It not only gave birth to the scientific revolution and industrial revolution followed by it, because the belief that we are created as the crown of the creation, gave us the reason to explore and examine God's orderly kingdom, and believe that we could understand the mathematical laws, that were given to it by its creator and lawgiver. But beyond that, it also gave us our western humanistic ethics, because Genesis story about Amago Day. That we were created as God's image, was understood that we all have intrinsic value as individual human beings, and thus also inalienable rights that our creator has given unto us. This is why Christians still emphasize, the sanctity of all human life, even those of unborn children or brain dead. Our Western intellectuals, religious and political leaders, have almost accomplished their end goal, to get rid of completely our Judeo-Christian roots. We have already rejected the notion of the literal creation, or intelligent design of the world. We think that Darwinism can explain better, the diversity of species and the origin of life, than the literal creator God of the biblical story. Then we have also rejected the biological and biblical notion of man and woman. If you still believe, as Jesus said in Matthew 19:4, that God created them from the beginning and made them male and female, you will be branded as a transphobic, whether you believe in God or basic human biology. So it is just a natural evolution, and the final step, to get rid of also our biblical and western notion regarding the inalienable rights of man. The outcome of this divorce is that, from the 17th century onwards, science was able to view nature in terms of its mechanisms. Nature became completely objectified. She became it. Meanwhile, humanity came to be seen as having the right, a human right that is, to explore, manipulate and exploit every element of the natural world for the betterment of mankind. It is essential to give something back to nature in return for what we so persistently and all the more arrogantly take from her. Our approach cannot all be based on rights. We have no regard for the masses. Satanism is a religion for the elite. It is a religion for leaders. It's a religion for competent people. Not, in fact, I believe that animals should be protected by humans as it is our duty as the inheritors of the earth to protect the ecology, to protect wildlife. And satanic ecology is forefront on our agenda. Mm -hmm. We need to protect the earth that we live on in our neck. Back to social Darwinism again. In the animal kingdom, you preserve what is strong. Hang on. You give more food to the stronger animal. Until humans you don't feed the weaker one. I, I, I'm, I'm Hitler was a masterful black magician, of course. He created a reality. Was it evil? I'm telling you that I don't believe in good and evil, and nor can any can anyone decide what is good and evil. It's all based on historical and cultural values. In my point of view, the Christian religion is evil, in quotes, but, but, because but it Nicholas, is negative. Nicholas, you, you're not willing really to say Hitler was evil. Absolutely not, because I'm not what, going to bow down to your level that, of good and evil. That's position. the moral place. Who determines it? Who has the right to determine what is good and evil? What? 
Of course, I would respond from the standpoint of the Christian ethic, but even even a humanist sitting in this chair. I don't like humanists any more than Christians. You don't like hum humanists either. Humanists, you have to understand this once and for all. Christians must know Satanism is not humanism. Humanism is based on Christian ethics and ideas. It just doesn't have Christ, but it has the same appalling ideas about equality love for everybody, indiscriminate love for all living things, and we oppose those Altruism, ideas. Altruism, humanitarianism, Humanism all and Christianity it. are in bed together. They're the same thing. There's well, no well the humanists might not appreciate that, but I of hear where you're coming wouldn't. from. Of course they One thing I can say, you Satanists are certainly more honest than most witches when it comes to acknowledging well, the authenticity, you like what the we reality of what we're doing. We're not, as I was saying, you might not like what we have to say, but we are honest. Nousevat hurmoksessa sarvipäätä symbolisoivaan saatanamerkkiin, asuja koristavat saatanalliset tunnukset, pentagrammit ja alaspäin käännetyt ristit. Paidat julistavat saatanan sanomaa ja pilkkaavat kristittyjen jumalaa. Rooliasuihin kuuluu sadomasokistisia piikkipantoja, ketjuja sekä lävistyksiä. Kauhukalleria täydentävät lystikkäät vampyyrit ja pikkunoidat, vikkat. On vapaus. Saatana on anarkia. Saatana on vapaus ju Jumalan tyranniasta. Jumalan kontrolli. Saatana on ihmisen vapaus tehdä mitä ihminen haluaa. Ihmisen vapaus olla sitä mitä hän todella haluaa olla. Saatana symbolien kanssa juhlakenttää hallitsevat natsitunnukset. Ja jotta soppa olisi täydellinen, sulassa sovussa näiden pahuuden palvelijoiden kanssa metallimusiikista nauttii sivareita, kasvissyöjiä ja muita ekoaktivisteja. Kun keskustelumme etenee, käy ilmi, että Pentti Lintolan maailmantuska sekä ekofasistiset ajatukset viehättävät tyttöjä. Ja mun mielestä toikin on liian paljon ihmisiä mun mielestä. Ää, me jäädään sama näkökulma. Mun mielestä ainakin ehkä 93 prosenttia ihmisten, siis koko maailman kansasta pitäisi tappaa. Ja maailma olisi myöskin olemaan yksi osa siitä. Jos... Koska sillä maailmasta on tarvitse, vaikka ihmiset, luonto alkaisi ehkä mahdollisesti, jos se osa ihmisistä olisi yhtään järkeviä, luonto alkaisi ehkä elää uudestaan, alkaisi elättää tätä maailmaa, alkaisi olla niin kuin oma. Mutta me ollaan tavallaan osa. Klassinen humanismi lähtee ajatuksesta, että ihmisellä on itseisarvo, ihminen on kaikkein arvokkaan. Ja meillä mun mielestä ihmisellä ei ole oikeastaan mitään arvoa, koska ihminen ei ole tehnyt mitään hyvää tälle maailmalle. Ei, ei todeta mitään hyvää. Ihmisen, ja siis varsinkin kristinuskon tuon jälkeen, ihmisen ei ole mitään hyvää annettavaa tälle maailmalle, mutta se, että teollistua lisää mitään. Ei yksinkertaisesti mitään hyvää. Yeah. Sen jälkeen on niin luonto hylätty täysin, ketä ne ennen kiinnostaa luonnon työ, hoki vaan haluaa lisää rahaa, lisää rahaa, lisää rahaa, lisää kauniita vaatteita, viinaa, tupakkaa, kauniita naisia, kauniita miehiä, urheiluautoja, joka on täysin turhaa. Nahkapää Kai Kotamies antaa kannatuksensa Impeen Nazarinin kehotukselle tappaa heikot ja elinkertaa. Se on ihan oikein. Ei heikkoja ja vammaisia semmoisia tarvitaan. Encyclopedia of White Power, a source book on the radical racist right, published in the year 2000, tells on page 191. Explicit Satanism would seem odd, in the present-day National Socialist movement, and indeed, it is the province of a small number of adherents. But the occult is a long-standing feature of National Socialist thought. From its inception, National Socialism has been to a considerable degree, a religion of nature, in every country, with an active National Socialist movement today, one of the key and most dearly held planks, of the group's programs gives ecological concerns an equal billing with questions of race and religion. The reasons for this are complex, centering on the National Socialist quest for purity in all its forms, be they racial or environmental. End quote. Today, in the liberal mainstream media, terms far-right and Christian have become almost synonymous. 
Although in historical sense, racist far right has been a bedfellow with various neo-pagan and satanic groups, who adhere the religion of nature. Adolf Hitler said in 1933, nothing will prevent me from tearing up Christianity from root and branch, and annihilating it in Germany. For our people it is decisive, whether they acknowledge the Judeo-Christian faith with its effeminate pity ethics, or a strong heroic belief in God and nature, God in our own people, in our destiny, in our blood. But picking up on what you're saying about the religion of nature, <clears throat> Officially, the Third Reich uh, remained uh, a, a ostensibly a Christian country. They got they were referred to as positive Christianity. There were a lot of Lutheran ministers that supported them. They had very difficult relations with the Catholic Church, but nevertheless, uh, they got a lot of support from that as well. But the Nazi elite, the vanguard, you are correct. These were people who were anti-Christian and they wanted to replace Christianity with a religion of nature. But this was more of a cultural epiphenomenal thing. I will say this in passing, there is an encyclopedia called the Encyclopedia of the Religion of Nature. And it came together by a bunch of academics who, for uh, other reasons, realized that there was a really strong connection between fascism, Nazism, and this nature worshiping. I've read that encyclopedia and I found over 400 paragraphs and entire entries that deal with the topic of the overlap between uh, Nazism and environmentalism and Nazism and fascism and this religion of nature. And that's one thing you'll find when you actually read a lot of the uh, original fascist and original Nazi writings is just full of this mother nature, mother earth, uh, nature in capital and stuff. But that was the, the Nazi vanguard. Uh, there were certain elements within the Nazi government who were really talking about, you know, replacing Christianity in Germany with a full blown sort of paganistic, pantheistic religion. But they were shot down. They were, they were proposing that during World War II. And a lot of the other ministers, cabinet ministers said, no, this this is no time to be sort of you know monkeying around with that uh, but yeah there was this strong element of that and if you read their literature uh, of the sort of the nazi vanguard like himmler and uh, rosenberg and that you think you're reading a greenpeace track yeah. in 1937 pope pius XI published an encyclical where he condemned nazi regime and neo-pagan pantheistic heresy it promoted alongside the persecution of the church and the idolatry of the race German historian, Professor Hans Bader Schwartz, has stated, We can therefore agree that the Nazi creed is essentially a pantheist vitalism. The God to which Nazis refer so often, is not the transcendent creator of a world, but the life of the cosmic organism. And this life flowers in the Nordic people whose purest and supreme representative is Nazi Germany, and above all, its semi-divine fewer. Hence the unbounded devotion to the state and its head, no other allegiance can be admitted. Ernst Lehmann said in 1934, We recognize that separating humanity from nature, from the whole of life, leads to humankind's own destruction and to the death of nations. Humankind alone is no longer the focus of thought, but rather life as a whole. This striving toward connectedness with the totality of life, with nature itself, a nature into which we are born, this is the deepest meaning and the true essence of National Socialist thought. For a variety of complicated political and theological reasons, a different definition of God began to emerge. Slowly but surely God began to be defined as something that lay outside of creation and was separate from nature. And as that happened, so nature itself came to be seen more and more as an unpredictable force. It framed the outlook that allowed science to make its clean break from religion and forge ahead towards modernity. It effectively shattered the organic unity of reality, which could be traced back to Plato and Pythagoras, and before them, the Egyptians, and the start of the Vedic tradition in India. At the heart of things, within a very short space of time, that all-important, timeless principle of participation in the being of things was eliminated from mainstream Western thinking. Or, to put it more graphically, with God separate from his creation, humanity likewise became separate from nature. 
Nature began to be seen as something outside of us. We were still a part of creation, as other things were, but we were no longer creation itself. Leading thinkers began to stress the role of humanity as the instrument of the will of God, an instrument that was free to pursue a mastery of the will over other things in nature. This may still seem terribly esoteric, but I have to say I find it very revealing. The outcome of this divorce is that, from the 17th century onwards, science was able to view nature in terms of its mechanisms. Nature became completely objectified. She became it. Nature was deemed by science to be inanimate, unconscious, and mechanistic. Intelligence and purpose were not to be found in nature, but outside it, the property of some sort of transcendent God which religion could deal with on its own. The idea that the universe was a living presence, that it had purpose, and was endowed with an inherent intelligence, had become, as it remains very much today, an inconceivable notion. Gone was God, the constant sacred presence that participated in the being of things, and in his place, an external, separate, arbitrary will that imposed itself upon nature, with humankind acting as its instrument. This arbitrary will is the God in the sky, outside the world of things, but connected to them through us, his instruments. By then, human willfulness had adopted the name of reason, and nature was being plundered and spoiled in the name of reason. There was nothing sacred about it at all. Nature had become nothing more than a great opportunity for experimentation and the supplier of natural resources. This is why it is of such profound importance that we understand we are not what we think we are. We are not the masters of creation. No matter how sophisticated our technology has become, the simple fact is that we are not separate from nature. Just like everything else, we are nature. Herein, Prince Charles is openly blaspheming God of the Bible and calling him and degrading names arbitrary will and God in the sky. This kind of blasphemy and pantheistic heresy is not a trivial thing, as we already saw its destructive fruits, in the crimes of Nazi regime. And yes, the Holocaust was indeed a consequence of their pantheistic religion of nature. If God, who is perfect and good, is this impersonal being in nature, then there cannot be a distinction between good and evil. Christian theistic dogma asserts that, Although God's creation was originally good and without evil, our rebellion against God brought sin, evil, and a curse, upon the whole creation of God. If God is one with his creation, then we have to believe in the sanctity and perfection of nature itself, as Prince Charles clearly believes. And if we humans are one with nature, then also we are good and perfect. There is no place for sin, and thus no need for atonement for our sins in the cross of Calvary. God does not need to become one with his creation, in his son Jesus Christ to atone for our sins, as he is already one with the creation. And if there is any place for good and evil, then living in harmony with nature, must be the only requirement for good. You, you're not willing to say Hitler was evil? Absolutely not, because I'm not what, going to bow down to your level of good and evil, that's the wrong place. Who determines it? Who has the right to determine what is good and evil? As Martin Bormann said it, when we National Socialists speak of belief in God, we do not mean, like the naive Christians and their spiritual exploiters, a man-like being sitting around somewhere in the universe. The force governed by natural law, by which all these countless planets move in the universe, we call omnipotence, or God. We National Socialists, on the other hand, demand of ourselves that we live as naturally as possible, that is to say, in accord with the natural laws of life. The more precisely we understand and observe the laws of nature and of life, and the more closely we adhere to them, the more we correspond to the will of that omnipotent force. By the laws of nature, Nazis like Bormann of course meant survival of the fittest, to justify their social Darwinistic, eugenistic programs. In 1935 Hermann Goering, commissioned German environmentalist Hans Kloss, 
to write Reich Nature Protection Law, who called it proudly, Magna Carta of Nature. Today Prince Charles is following very closely, in the footstep of those early Nazi programs. The interdependence between human health and planetary health has never been more clear. As we start a new decade, it is time to focus on the future we wish to build and indeed leave for generations to come. Humanity has made incredible progress over the past century, yet the cost of this progress has caused immense destruction to the planet that sustains us. We simply cannot maintain this course indefinitely. To build a productive and sustainable future, it is critical that we accelerate and mainstream sustainability into every aspect of our economy. More than 800 years ago, the Magna Carta inspired a belief in the fundamental rights and liberties of people. As we strive to imagine the next 800 years of human progress, the fundamental rights and value of nature lie at the heart of the Terra Carta and represent a step change in our future of industry and future of economy approach. Sounds nice, but what he is not telling you is that Magna Carta and Terra Carta are mutually exclusive documents. You cannot maintain both human rights and so-called nature's rights. I mean you can, and you should, defend the rights of animals from a biblical viewpoint. But if you see planet Earth as some kind of a cosmic organism, and yourself as her messianic healer, as Prince Charles clearly does, then you have to remove that lethal cancer from her like a benevolent doctor, to save her from the destruction. You know, you're an environmentalist. It's like, well, are you sure you're not the Messiah? Are you sure that's not what you're doing you're the savior of the planet it's like are you sure that's so good for your ego and it's not it's it's not my entire reason for writing this book is that i feel i would be failing in my duty to future generations and to the earth itself if i did not attempt to point this out and indicate possible ways we can heal the world i feel the time may now be more appropriate I sense a growing unease and anxiety in people's souls. It seems possible to me that we could create the conditions that ensure human societies thrive indefinitely. There will be cynical critics who will scoff at such a utopian suggestion. But if they choose to dismiss such a vision, then it is incumbent upon them to come up with something better. Thus we stand at an historic moment. We face a future where there is a real prospect that if we fail the Earth, we fail humanity. Well, I know you're not a huge fan of the royals, but a little later in that interview, Charles revealed how he's keeping in touch with the common people when it comes to everyday motoring. Check this out. My old Aston Martin, which I've had for 51 years, that runs on, can you believe this? surplus English white wine you and, and whey the from the cheese process. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you didn't catch that, uh, Prince Charles Aston Martin runs on wine and cheese. <laughs> See, he's a man of the people. See, he's giving back. He's and relatable. Is that, is that what you're going to try and tell no, me? No, he's giving back to the environment. With an Aston Martin that <laughs> runs on wine and cheese. Yeah. Pompous, oh. privileged, Peanuts. No, it's not peanuts, it's cheese. No, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, cheese. Yeah. And wine. But it's but because it's good he for cares the environment. about the environment. He loves the environment. He cares about us, the common people. Do you care about privilege or the environment? What comes first? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, he's doing the right thing. Can't you can't you just, you know, love everything? No. no. That man will be our next head of state. Yeah. Can, oh, thank can you. I, can, can you believe that? Why not? That relatable. Yeah. Wonderful. Jeez, you get fired up. <laughs>